I know you must be feeling many emotions, elation, relief, euphoria, some people still feeling disappointed. We'll get into all of that here on the Soccer OG World Cup Daily. And what you can feel is absolute victory. That is uh, what the United States were able to achieve. One Cero, as they get through to the round of 16, scoring just two goals in group games. This is a fortress of a defensive team. It is their strength. And now we get to look forward to another game. How good does that feel? We're here on a, a Tuesday, and we already know Saturday, 7 a.m. Pacific time, we have something to do. I got a watch party to go to. And if the World Cup is to end there, so be it. Because if it ends after three games in the groups compared to four games, we always talk about el quinto partido, how Mexico can't get to the quarterfinals. Yeah, that's tough when you keep getting there. But not getting to that fourth game. I mean, that's when the party really starts. I mean, the U.S. can put their feet up and watch games on Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and see teams sweat it and disappointment knowing they're in. They are in. Saturday will play the Netherlands. We'll have plenty of time to preview that. Before we get into our uh, comprehensive recap of USA Iran, I want to remind everyone the Soccer OG World Cup Daily is available in audio form where all podcasts are available. It is available here via the video in our incredible graphics package. A shout out to my guy, Brett, who has been doing an incredible job making this show look so professional. Much more ahead. We also want to remind everyone that it is presented by our very fine partners at Farmer John. I get a different pack of bacon, obviously, here in the studio to show you every day. So uh, what we're, we're talking about. I hope you started your day with some smokehouse bacon, maybe some a classic bacon. And uh, I, I had it with scrambled eggs. I had it with scrambled eggs. Again, tomorrow I might have a, a, a Cliff Bar or... A, a hard-boiled egg or a banana, but a couple days, USA Game Days, it's Farmer John. So we want to thank uh, Farmer John for all of that, but let's get into this game. We have a lot of ground to cover. I know I've used that joke before. <laughs> Everyone, please settle down. We have a lot of ground. We do have a lot of ground to cover. I'm trying to try and preview everything, but we, our promise here on the Soccer OG is we're not going to eat up a lot of your time. I speak quicker, and it's about lots of information that you can use to talk about with your friends. So the United States... Taking on Iran, the starting 11 would come out, and there were a couple changes. Uh, somewhat, one mildly surprising is Josh Sargent returns to the starting 11 for Haji Wright. And then the one that was surprising, Cameron Carter Vickers, who uh, has not played at all, really hasn't played a lot at all for the national team, comes in for Walker Zimmerman. My belief is, and we saw it in the game, Carter Vickers a little more, more mobile. I mean, he's more mobile than Reem and Zimmerman, but Reem is almost irreplaceable at this point, the way he plays. But because of that, and really, both fullbacks were wingers. I mean, technically, we had two guys defending the majority of the game. We were a 2-3-2-2 two, two, two formation. So because of that, the idea is Cameron Carter Vickers can cover any ground. And if I don't get a chance to talk about Cameron Carter Vickers, let me say he did that. He was fantastic. I was worried about making the change. It seemed like for the sake of making a change, and maybe Zimmerman's in there and they maintain the, uh, the clean sheet against uh, Iran. But Cameron Carter-Vickers, who just passes the eyeball test, he has a great future. He plays at Celtic, so he's already in Europe getting big minutes. But uh, he has a, a very bright future. When everyone's healthy, this U.S. defense is very exciting. You obviously have Tim Ream's not going to be there. Zimmerman will. And then you have... Cameron Carter Vickers and Miles Robinson and Chris Richards and whoever, uh, um, Austin Trusty, he's a, a rising star in the defensive ranks. We are a defensive team, and I want to get that across to you perfectly crystal clear. This is a defensive team. Yeah, we have Christian Pulisic and we have Tim Way and we have Gio Rain and we have these attacking options, but this team's meat and potatoes is on defense. And that is part of the story here because one thing is what I said yesterday. I believe that the United States eventually are going to start scoring goals. After this game, I'm not so sure. And as we get into the fourth game, and remember, the most you can play is seven. If you get into a fourth or fifth game, you know who you are. 
And the U.S., the reason I know that the goals aren't coming is they're not getting shots. They're not, they got five shots on goal, which was really good. But they're amongst, they were the lowest team on shots coming into this game. I think they may have moved up a couple based on those five. So they're not getting chances. They're not creating chances. They're in the round of 16, so they're doing something right. So you lean in defensively as to your calling card. And I know, look, we're going to talk about the perception of this team. They're, I said it on Twitter. When I got on Twitter and I was sending a, a congratulatory tweet, people were upset. People were upset about the tactics. People were upset about the substitutions. And I'm like, <laughs> what? Uh, I mean, <laughs> I've been watching this game a very long time. And before you poo-poo defending, I want to I I get this out first about the U.S., and what Greg Berhalter did late. We weren't scoring goals. We had the chance to put this away. Tim Weah was a, a kneecap offside. Josh Sargent didn't see Christian Pulisic bombing up the left side. We could have put it away in the first half, but we didn't. We're not scoring chances. So I want to mention this very quickly so that uh, you can understand how football works. It's not pretty a lot of times. It's not. And sometimes you, uh, a lot of coaches that are very well respected are given a lot of credit for being counter punchers. No one gives Uruguay, I mean, Uruguay not doing well here, but Uruguay is a counter punching team. They don't want the ball. They don't play an attractive style, even though they have exciting attacking players to their detriment here, but it's wor it worked for them four years ago. It's worked for them historically. Spain, the case of Spain it won the World Cup in 2010. I'm going to read the score lines for Spain. And remember, this is a lot of a good attacking players on this team. I'm going to read the score lines for the team that won the World Cup in 2010. Opening game, lost to Switzerland, one settle. Next game, beat Honduras, two settle. Third game, uh, beat Chile, 2-1. They make it to the knockout stages. First game, beat Portugal, one settle. Quarterfinals, beat Paraguay, one settle. Semi-finals, beat Germany, one settle. Final, beat Holland. One settle, who said that? Congratulations, you're getting a Farmer John hat. I said that, I'm keeping my Farmer John hat. Argentina in the 2014 World Cup with Lionel Messi. It was one settle, one settle, one settle. Trying to beat teams 4-1 doesn't work, so you do this. Second part of this, Using, bringing in Walker Zimmerman, playing with three center backs, bringing in Shaq Moore uh, to fill up that back five. Defensive tactics. The United States had a blueprint or saw the error of their ways. In Wales, they didn't make adjustments. Remember, we were all upset. They didn't make adjustments and they let Wales get an equalizer. They didn't bring in a third center back. Greg Berhalter, remember that. He said, I'm bringing in a third center back. And guess what? It worked. It was, I know it was uncomfortable, and we're sitting there like, it wasn't that bad, to be honest. There was a couple chances by Iran. It was uncomfortable, but you know it because you're not touching the ball there, so your other team's going to get to play. So you're getting negative. The U.S. didn't do that against Wales, and it cost them. They did it against Iran, and they got the result. Folks, this is Soccer 101. It's, this was the right choice for the United States. I give you two data points, the Spain example and the Wales example. So in this game, the United States were pressing. We're getting nervous. 38th minute. Uh, it was actually well started by Matt Turner. Then uh, it falls to Weston McKinney. Lobs the ball in. Serginho Dest to Christian Pulisic. Two great things I loved about this goal. One, that we got a goal from a wide area. Remember crosses and corners. It ain't working. It wasn't that wide, but it was wide enough because Dest was the fullback coming in. And then the second part is Christian Pulisic just putting his body on the line. And now we know he, uh, he went to the hospital and he has a uh, pelvic contusion. He's day-to-day. -day. <laughs> Contusion's not that bad, but anything with the word pelvic in it, I, I don't want on my body or anyone else's, quite frankly. No pelvic contusions. No pelvic contusions in this house. He, he got on the phone, I think it was with Weston McKinney. He goes, you better believe I'm playing Saturday. He's playing Saturday. Great video with U.S. Men's National Team. He's awaiting at the uh, hotel for the players and hugging them, etc. It was absolutely wonderful to see. This is a great day, folks. I'm sorry I got a little bit off, off topic there, but this is a great day. 
Eight and a half years. We're in the final 16. We've got an, we're playing the Netherlands. We, we learned from our mistakes. And it, we, we should all be so excited. And this is great for me. More people are going to watch the World Soccer OG World Cup Daily because the U.S. is still in it. It's great for you. We all have the U.S. team in it. And I, I got to say, people like watching this U.S. team play. The global audience, they like this. This U.S. team has been exciting, even though they haven't scored goals. And people are digging how Tyler Adams plays. He's, he's an absolute hero. He's an absolute uh, superstar at his possession. And he, just trajectory here. People like to see Weston McKinney. People like to see Anthony Robinson and Serginio Dest fly as fullbacks. Christian Pulisic goes without saying. Tim Weah, we'd like to see Gio Reyna, obviously. And uh, we'll carry on from that. As with regards to the scoring situation, uh, like I said, we are a defensive team. We have no nuance. We have no personality. We have no presence in the attacking positions. It's gotten so, the bar has gotten so low that people are raving about Josh Sargent holdup play. <laughs> it's like we've already conceded the fact that we're not going to get goals from that position, let alone shots. I wanted Jesus Ferreira. I stand by Jesus Ferreira. Coming into this team, uh, Josh Sargent may be injured and unavailable. Haji Wright, I don't know if we can play Haji Wright. He had a real shocker. Jesus Ferreira gives me results at least, especially if we're not scoring goals. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna second guess Greg because he he's guessed it right. And by the way, if you don't like Shaq Moore coming in, this is what I would say. Greg Berhalter does not have an axe to grind with any of these players, but what he does, there are always he's watching his trainings. He is watching training after training after training. He's watching guys make plays in these trainings. I guarantee you that is why Cameron Carter Vickers played in this game because he's going, I got to get this guy in the game. He's probably saying that about Shaq Moore, as unbelievable as you might think that sounds. Guys are earning minutes. That's how sports works. You train well, you play. You, that's it. So... Uh, Maybe Jesus Ferreira is not training as well. So I, I respect Greg Berhalter. If I don't see a player playing, there's a good reason. We could argue it, but we don't, we're not privy to all of that information. So we're not getting the number nine. And I'll get back to the Dutch game a little bit and how maybe there's an opportunity to approach this a little differently. There were uh, the subs really quickly. Christian Pulisic couldn't go. Brendan Aronson replaced them at the half. 65th minute, Kellen Acosta came in for Weston uh, McKinney. They, they brought in the defensive players and Moore and Zimmerman, Weah came out uh, and all of those changes. Um, uh, Shaq Moore for Dest, Haji Wright for Sargent, that was injury related, and Walker Zimmerman for Weah. So uh, there were some good chances there at the end. Second half, they, they kind of said we're gonna defend and I am okay with that. We gotta make sure Pulisic is getting better. There's so many bright spots this. Our midfield is a consistent force. Matt Turner, he's here to be a shot stopper, but Matt Turner is not just stopping shots, he is distributing the ball. Long, beautiful passing. Matt Turner is in the discussion for the best goalkeeper in this tournament. The numbers suggest he's had Two clean sheets. And by the way, defensively, this U.S. team has not allowed a goal in open play. The one goal that was scored was a penalty. These are incredible defensive numbers. You, you should be doing backflips because you know it's an American football saying, you know what it is? Defense wins championships. It's the same in soccer. If you give up goals, you are dead in this sport. The U.S. is not giving up goals, and they weren't giving up goals coming into the World Cup. All of their games are kind of like this. This is who we are. It's not that sexy, but defense wins championships. I'm getting a little preachy here. I'm sorry. But uh, that's the way it goes, and the U.S. learned a lesson, and it is a fantastic, fantastic situation coming in. Quickly, the other game in the group, England thumped Wales. Uh, I think of note here... Gareth Bale came out at the half for Brennan Johnson. Uh, Kiefer Moore said, can't wait to not England out of the World Cup. He ate his words in a big way. And uh, the English, I mean, we, Phil Foden made an appearance, scored a goal. Marcus Rashford, Marcus Rashford has three goals. That's co-tied with, the team play, with uh, three or four other players right now in the World Cup. 
but this is a guy really coming in. So England finishes first in the group. USA finishes second, unbeaten, five points. Five, that's great. Uh, there it is, Iran third and Wales finishing fourth. I wanted to say this about Iran. I know there was a lot of, there was a lot of bad blood. We didn't know where it was coming from. Was it from the Iranian government? Was it the Iranian media, the, the Iranian people? It wasn't. Uh, I just want to say how much I respect these Iranian players uh, to be mired in this political upheaval, to try and do the best thing while you're in the middle of this competition. This is very difficult. They have my utmost respect and my hat's off to them. And we should respect what these Iranian players did. It was, uh, it was almost an unwinnable situation and they took it to the very end. So the Iranian fans should be very proud of their team. I think we said, uh, Serginho Dest, I wanted to say 88% possession, 74 touches, 88% passing, 74 touches, really good. Really quickly, the other groups, the, the other games in, uh, it was Group A, which affects the U.S. directly. Netherlands beat Qatar 2-0. Uh, Qatar, the worst host performance of a team. I could rip the organizational part, but I'm really enjoying this World Cup, especially since the U.S. are going through, that I think this World Cup will be viewed positively on the field when we look back at what happened here. But uh, a lot of questions about the Qatari organizational and now their team, there was like a, a moment, there were a three month, like a concentration to concentrate on this, uh, on this thing. And that, you know, you don't see your family members. Don't do that. That doesn't work. Listen to Luis Enrique of Spain. He says players can have, uh, have sex with uh, their significant others. So that didn't work. The Netherlands, Cody Gakpo scoring another goal. He is there with Marcus Rashford for three goals. And uh, they kind of plotted away. They haven't really blown you away. There's a, a Memphis Depay. I, I just ha haven't seen him. There's no real identity to this Dutch team. <laughs> and now they're going to play again Saturday against the United States. But they're also a dangerous team. When these teams plot around the whole time and they don't do anything, uh, the fact that they're still in the competition tells you they're really good. I, look, they, they didn't look good against Ecuador, but they win the group, right? So uh, this is going to be interesting from the U.S. perspective because they play with the back three. It's Ake and it's Timber and Virgil van Dijk, obviously. And I, I think the U.S. playing with that front three. And by the way, Josh Sargent was drifting out wide a lot. He wasn't a center forward. So maybe there's an opportunity for Gio Reyna here. Or I saw Brendan Aronson play a little center forward for a, a, a blip there. Or Christian Pulisic. Maybe you'd be creative because there's different ways to beat the back three. You know you have the fullbacks, uh, which is going to be a very good positive for the U.S. I like that matchup. But you got to find a way to probe. Three very good defenders back there. And then that midfield is going to try and clog it up. And they'll see if they can get it to... It's going to be Gakpo. Depay, I, I have no fear of. It's just been a huge disappointment. We'll preview that much more in the days ahead. As the Netherlands win, Qatar 0 for 3. Ecuador, Senegal, really good game there. Senegal winning 2-1. Ecuador, uh, this is on their manager, Gustavo Alfaro. He just didn't... He didn't have it... He, he, this team was so good against the Dutch and they went really defensive. So you saw the U.S. going defensive in the second half. You can't go defensive from the beginning of the game. It's too much time. Ecuador did it. Gustavo Alfaro is to blame here. They should, have, they should have been more aggressive from the beginning. They were a deer in headlights and they got bullied by the Senegal effort. Set pieces. Ecuador was able to tie it in the 67th minute and then... Uh, Koulibaly scored uh, from a, a free kick a little bit later. I want to say uh, how impressive I was with Idrissa Gay. Unfortunately, he's going to be suspended for the England game in the round of 16, but he, was, uh, he has filled that leadership role uh, that was vacated by the injured Sadio Mane. Senegal, the first African team, they have been tremendous. Big disappointment for Ecuador. We'll be back here on the Soccer OG World Cup Daily. We will preview Group C and D, Argentina and Mexico. <laughs>we are back here on the soccer og world cup daily time to start filling out your bracket 16 teams we already know the identity of four of them four more spots on hand here on wednesday let's start in group d these are the 7 a.m pacific time games 10 a.m eastern this is uh currently 
with France have already qualified. They have six points. Australia, three. Denmark and Tunisia behind them with a point apiece. And we'll start with Tunisia and France. Surprisingly, the first ever competitive match between these two countries. And I, I say that there's a, a, certainly a French influence in Tunisia and in North Africa in many of the places. They're not separated by too much there. Uh, it is uh, the big question coming in here from the French perspective. They've won the, they, technically they haven't finished first in the group, but they have such an, a, a, a big goal differential advantage over the only team that can catch them, Australia, because remember they beat them 4-1. It's like they're going to win this group. So Didier Deschamps has already promised wholesale changes we will see what they look like. Remember, this is if you can rest some players, you rest players. This competition, you, you there's just not a lot of time between games, at least not until after the quarterfinals. Then once you get there, you can kind of you can uh, you can put more trainings in, you can rest your body. But right now, you get rest where you can. So uh, he was asked uh, about Mbappe, Kylian Mbappe, who's been the best player in this tournament. Another guy at the top. I'll quickly let you know. So it's. Gakpo, Rashford, Enter Valencia, and Kylian Mbappe all at three goals. France has looked the best. They are the odds-on team, in my estimation, to win it right now. But this is a good spot to rest it. Tunisia still have a chance of advancing, and actually a pretty decent one. So uh, remember, they got the point against Denmark, but they have to beat France, and that probably isn't going to happen. But France has been thinned out. So if they're going to make wholesale changes, we're getting a little further down the pecking order here. Because remember, no Encante and N'Golo Kante and no Paul Pogba and no Karim Benzema or Nkunku. And, you know, they've had to deal with a lot of injuries. And France is deep, but there is a limit to everyone here. So Didier Deschamps says he will not preserve the ego of Mbappe. He says he is a very humble guy and uh, that he would understand if he was rested, which makes me feel like he is. We want to see Mbappe. By the way, I mean, tomorrow could be amazing. You have Messi, you have Mbappe, Christian Eriksen, and then, of course, Mexico, which is so compelling in its own right. Uh, Wabi Khazri came on. He's like a second all-time leading scorer for Tunisia. He hasn't really played here. They looked really good in that first game. Uh, Jalel Kadri, their manager, admits to tactical mistakes on the job against Australia. They should not be losing to Australia. Maybe Thai. Australia is so limited uh, talent-wise, but yet here they are. Australia gets through with a point against Denmark, which we'll get to here in a minute. But the French, this is a chance. I think, I think Mbappe plays some here, but you give a chance to some of these younger players. You get a, this is maybe that opportunity to do it. And the French... Reserves should be good enough to beat Tunisia, but it certainly makes things interesting here. This is the group that isn't the most compelling by by any means, and if you have to watch a game, you probably should watch Australia and Denmark, which uh, the Danes have 1.2 games. They need goals. Australia had that incredible victory over Tunisia that have put them in a situation that they could actually win two games at the World Cup for the first time ever. The win against Tunisia was their first win in the World Cup since 2010. And remember, Australia is a regular participant here. So that is a pretty historically significant stat right there. Uh, this Australian spirit is something that you can't put your finger on. And the way Denmark's playing, Australia have to feel pretty confident they can get a point and really upset the uh, the group stages. There's going to have to be some surprises for everything that's happened thus far. <clears throat> England, USA, and <laughs> Netherlands and Senegal. Those aren't surprising results yet. France, Denmark are what's supposed to happen here. If Australia do it, this is the first big real shock result. And then we'll see about Group D. So um, there is... Uh, this Danish team, which I think we're all awaiting for them to awaken. Casper uh, Hulman uh, had a very long address uh, for the Danish media, and he said emotions in camp are running very, very high. Pre-tournament, Denmark had to, held to such a lofty standard. They, uh, uh, they were I mean, amazing in qualifying. No team picked up more points in UEFA qualifying than Denmark. They beat France twice in Nations League. They looked like a top 5-6 team coming to the World Cup. I picked them to make a final. That's how high I was impressed by what they looked like. But things change. But things can change back. Uh, 
Kielman said that he expects Australia to run at them, which I was a little surprised at, but maybe they do. Maybe we see an aggressive Australia. Uh, by the way, there was a ticketing mix-up. So one thing you will notice about Australia, who haven't sent as many fans as usual, uh, they're not in big pockets, which is disappointing. So I don't know what this ticketing mix-up, but you can't mix up the tickets because part of the appeal of going to World Cup is sitting with your countrymen and women, right? You want to be there in the colors and cheer together and feel like you're part of lifting your team's efforts. And by the way, you are. The fans are influential. Look at the Senegalese effort uh, today. That was fan-driven. That was incredible. Maybe these are African teams, man. One's already in. I, I think they get at least two. They might get three. That's amazing. Amazing. If that was to happen. Don't think it'll be Tunisia here in a, a group. I said Group C. This is actually Group D. Pardon me. But um, Denmark went from a 3-5-2 to a 3-4-3. The, the key to me is giving Christian Eriksen space. He hasn't had it. So maybe there is a back four, which would make sense. Uh, they, the three defenders would go to the back four, and then you have some space for Eriksen to create. They're not scoring goals. They need to score. And they have you know, one goal in this tournament in two games. And they, they really should advance. You want to see Denmark just exhale and start to loosen up. Because they are tight, tight right now. A tight as a tiger. Uh, we'll see. Let's move along. Let's move along to Group C. Group C, which this is really interesting into the run-up. And it could go a, a, a several different directions. So this is the standings. Poland, four points with a plus two goal differential. Argentina, three with a plus one. Saudi Arabia, three with a minus one. And Mexico, one point with a minus two goal differential. Um, unlikely, but Mexico could win the group still. <laughs> no, they can't. They can't win the group. No, they can finish second. Uh, but it can go, it could completely flip-flop in this. Let's start here with uh, uh, Mexico and Saudi Arabia. Mexico still hasn't scored a goal. The, uh, they are, they're a minus 145 favorite. So the sports books likes them a lot. This is the worst in 30 years when uh, the last time they didn't get out of the groups was 19... Since they, they were kicked out of the tournament in 1990, they've made it out of the groups every time. You have to go all the way back to 1978 for the last time that they didn't make it out of the groups. And that is likely to happen. This is being you know, heralded as one of the worst Mexican teams ever. Uh, Tata Martino, he's already gone. There are, there are the, the, you, you go on these Mexican sports shows and they're already, the, the top news story is who's going to replace him. And everyone's being mentioned. Maria Pochettino. <clears throat> I mean, he was the biggest name, but there's other guys there as well. But Tata's still in charge. And he said, this was an interesting quote. He goes, we are, we are not afraid. We, we're here to play football. We're not afraid to compete. Uh, there was some, uh, Andres Guardado also addressed it and the topic of goals came up and that is, he said, something obviously we worry about. Much like the U.S., no one in CONCACAF are scoring goals. And Mexico is just not getting results. Three wins in their last 11 games. So this is kind of the Mexico we saw coming in. Sometimes what you see is what you don't get. What you see is what you get here for Mexico. Uh, Chucky Lozano, it has to come from him. Alexis Vega has been great. Nothing happening in the center of the attack. They have to change the... Uh, remember, I will say this about Mexico. They, they, they played a defensive game and it almost worked against Argentina. But we had Hector Herrera and Andres Guardado. Guardado came out early. He says he's going to be back. It's got to be Edson Alvarez in that midfield. He, he has got to come in there and uh, be part of uh, a less compact midfield that can get something going for this team. I think it's going to be... I, I, it's going to be Martin with Vega Lozano, Pineda behind him, Chavez, and Edson Alvarado, and then the back four that we kind of seen throughout this, this tournament. That's going to be uh, what Mexico has to do, get the victory. If their best bet is for Poland to beat Argentina, that is probably very unlikely. If that game ends in a tie, they, uh, they still have a shot. They would have to... They need Argentina, well, they would need to, they need, if Argentina beats Poland, they're in business. 
If Argentina beats Poland by, say, two goals, then Mexico wins by two against Saudi Arabia, they'll get through. So they need Argentina to win or they need Poland to win. I don't think a tie is going to do much unless they blow the doors off of Saudi Arabia. And when you haven't scored a goal, that's not happening. By the way, a Liverpool link with Chucky Lozano should be very interesting. Saudi Arabia, I almost forgot to talk about them. Hervé Renard has done an incredible job. They might still win this group. I know Mexico's a big favorite here, but Saudi Arabia won the game against Argentina, got it away from Poland. They were competitive. They were attacking. Who's to say they don't beat a Mexico team that's running on fumes? If they win, then Saudi Arabia, if Poland-Argentina ties, which could happen, Saudi Arabia wins the group. If they win, they're in. They are into the next round. It's possible. Even a tie might get Saudi Arabia in. So that's why this group is absolutely uh, wonderful to watch. I, I underestimate the Saudis at your own peril. I think they'll be ready for this very interesting game, as is Argentina-Poland. And when you talk about Argentina, you've got to talk about that man, creative midfield force that changed everything against Mexico. And of course, I'm talking about Enzo Fernandez. <laughs> Dead serious. <laughs> Enzo Fernandez has changed this tournament for Argentina. And we shouldn't be too surprised. He was at River Plate, sold to Benfica. He has been delivering to with the Portuguese club in Champions League. Argentina had a problem in their midfield when Lo Celso couldn't play. So they bought in Guido uh Guido Rodriguez and he just, and Paredes wasn't really doing well. Rodrigo de Paul wasn't doing well in that support for Lionel Messi. Papu Gomez in a more attacking role. Nothing. Nothing was working. And then, like a ray of light, here comes Enzo Fernandez and everything has been resolved for Lionel Scaloni. They were absolutely freaking out. We could see them on the sideline. Argentina in the game against Mexico, scored two goals on 0.3 expected goals. They were not supposed to score in that game. Expected goals, I know, fool's gold, but they still tell a story. They got that goal from Messi, which was such a weird goal, it kind of just went, I don't even think Lionel Messi, Lionel Messi hit it thinking that it was gonna go in. Enzo Fernandez was involved in the creation of that goal, and then he scores the second goal, so, this, is, this could be one of those moments where Argentina gets things right. You point to Enzo Fernandez. When they did well in 2014, it wasn't Lionel Messi that put him over the line. It was Javier Mascherano. Maybe we get a different midfielder this time around in Fernandez. To me, he's been the big story, not just for Argentina, but in this group. We can talk about Lionel Messi. The best thing for Argentina is to have Lionel Messi take the headlines and Enzo Fernandez or somebody else do that, but he is their best. He has become their second most important player. Some could say he has become their most important player. Um, Lionel Messi, who uh, made history, now the oldest and the youngest player to both score and assist in a single World Cup, going all the way back to 1966. And now here they are, Poland. We have not given Poland any love, any respect. Respect that name. I mean, they were competitive in Mexico, missed penalty away from winning that. They battled with the Saudis and they came out on top. Robert Lewandowski scored that second goal. And I will say this, that Lewandowski goal looming large because it really put them above that goal differential situation in case uh, they have some entanglements. I just wanna see how Argentina, I, I, I think this is a tie right here, which is good for Poland and Argentina. I, I, I think Poland, we know what we, we can get from them. They're going to be rigid. They're, not, they're going to be tough to break down. I haven't seen enough from Argentina to say, oh, the Saudi Arabia game is behind them. This team is now one of the favorites again. They're not there. A lot of questions. That many have been answered by Enzo Fernandez, but we got to see a little bit more before we bless Argentina with that. Here we go. <laughs> the USA, enjoy it. We'll see you Saturday. We'll see if Mexico can join them in the round of 16. The Soccer OG World Cup Daily, where all podcasts are available, available on YouTube under my name, Max Bretos. Thank you for the support. We'll be back here again tomorrow.